My name is James Watson. I am one of the natural resource planners at the Whidbey Island Conservation District, and I'm here to present on uh, native plant uh, selection um, in preparation for this upcoming uh, planting season and um, getting ready, you know, for things like uh, buying plants at the, the uh, uh, native plant sale that we're going to be putting on. So, um, as we're going along, if you have any questions or if you you know want to add into anything that I'm that I'm talking talking about, uh, feel free. Um, you can also add in, um, you know, it, add it into the chat and uh, Allison, uh, who's also here as well with um, the Conservation District, she'll be able to, uh, you know, uh, let me know to, to uh, answer some of these questions as we go. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to happy to, to help. Um, I have a background in habitat restoration. I've I've worked in habitat restoration for about six years. And before I came to the uh, conservation district, I was a, uh, a landscaper that specialized in um, doing ecological planting. So uh, I actually was just uh, at one of my plantings that I did. It's a wetland mitigation in uh, Japanese Gulch in Mukilteo. <clears throat> and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's funny as I'm, as I'm walking around there um, with, with the ecologist, who's also an old friend of mine who, who we had worked together in the field in restoration. Um, you know, we were looking at it and, and talking about, you know, specifically plant placement and why things went where. And um, it's just it's one of those things that it's it's always it's it's always on our minds as as gardeners as landscapers as ecologists and it's one of my favorite things it's it's really one of my favorite things to talk about so um, if I start getting in the weeds with things um, bear with me I'll, I'll try to I'll try to get out as quickly as I can and and, and move forward so um, thank you for all showing up and uh, let's get started. So when we're talking about native plant selection, we're looking for what's best for your yard. And I know on, on Whidbey, you know, we're talking about all the different kinds of yards that, that you could possibly have. So uh, anything from a, you know, a regular urban landscape to, you know, a, a pretty wild, you know, almost a, almost an old growth type forest. So let's explore some of those different options for you. Okay. So when I'm looking for a plant, in uh to go into a spot I'm, I'm i'm assessing the overall habitat i'm over i'm assessing the overall landscape and i'm, I'm looking at what the environment is like so um one of the first things that you're going to be doing is you know specifically looking at you know what the soil conditions are like what the what the lighting is like what the what the drainage is like if there's going to be a lot of water um and when you are going to be um if you're if you're going to be looking at different plants like if you're trying to plant native plants that um uh, are specific to your ecosystem it's 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 really helpful and it's a lot of fun to just you know take a look around in local parks uh go to the beach um you know see what's see what's going on around there it, oftentimes you'll find that the plants that are growing there are, you know they're beautiful and they might actually be quite delicious um and i'm thinking of uh, black cap raspberries in, in in particular but in specific like with black cap raspberries it might not necessarily work for your your yard if it's you know too thorny and you want to be able to have access and things like that so um when you're thinking about uh, putting plants into your into your ecosystem into your landscape, um, try to try to think about you know all your different all your different sorts of um, preferences and uh, the sorts of access that you want to have, um, and you know be able to be able to work with what's going on around you. Um, one of the I think one of the best things to be using uh, plants that are specific to your ecosystem is that they're really easy to manage. They they take very little maintenance, and uh, you know you're you're not watering them nearly as much as you'd be watering ornamental metal plants, for instance. So, um, you know, knowing that knowing the history of your site, knowing what's what's been there before is is really critical to, to being able to make a good uh, choice for for a low maintenance planting in particular. Um, when we're when we're trying to put in plants like for for erosion control uh, for conservation uh, in particular, uh, we're we're talking about different kinds of plants for erosion control. Um, I, I I'm sure that that folks uh, are interested in being able to keep slopes and bluff, uh, bluffs healthy. Um, I work with uh, Shore Friendly here on the island with uh, in partnership with Island County, and working on slopes and bluffs is is one of those things that we we do a lot. 
the only thing we do. We 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 do um, you know shoreline plantings as well. Um, but but having the right plants that can help you out with the different sorts of ecosystem concerns you have, with the different hazards that you might have, um, it's it's really important to think about um, you know. Um, uh, is there going to be weight bearing down on the slope? And there's, there's when it comes to plant selection, we're we're talking about a whole bunch of different, uh, a whole bunch of different factors when it comes to specific conditions. Overall, you know, when we're when we're talking about plants for your your landscape, um, you know, we're not necessarily looking at, I should say, like your close in landscape around your home. We're not necessarily looking at these same sorts of things. Um, so this is this is kind of one of those, you know, one of those one of those great parts about Woodby is having having the the variety of different habitat, uh, different landscape uh, types that you can have. Um, one of the, I think one of the best parts of being on the island as well is the variety of uh, native flowers, local, like specific to the ecosystems that we have um, that are in the prairies. And um, we can talk more about, uh, you know, choosing different different pollinator uh, types that will be able to provide sources throughout the year and you know just really really beautiful plants um, so when we're talking about some of the really really great plants that do well um, just about anywhere i would say um we're we're looking at um you know some of these two here these are these are two of the superstars um when we're when we're looking at uh particularly um forest understories or uh, forest edges um with with uh, good drainage and um they can tolerate some you know some seasonal uh some seasonal moisture and really prolonged drought the you know, slough is great snowberry is is even even more so um it's one of those one of those plants that you can you can put put just about anywhere throughout the landscape um just going going through some of the different plants that that we can we can put in particularly some of the some of the upland uh, landscapes that we have throughout the island um when I say upland, I mean some of the drier areas, some of the areas that um, are particularly under the under under uh, forest understories, and um, can thrive in lower light conditions, and um, will receive uh, moisture throughout the year, but tend to receive a little bit less, uh, particularly direct moisture, uh, much more drought resistant plants. And um, I, I don't know if everybody had a chance to take a look at the the right plant uh, right place um, uh, booklet, but I, I'll, I'll pull that up in just a, in just a moment so we can so we can take a look at uh, in depth at, at some some more of, of what these um, sorts of things I'm talking about, like matching up the the light conditions with the the the, the moisture tolerance and things like that. Um, when we're when we're planting, it's also uh, important to know. Um, I think the the different the different types of uh, methods that are important. Uh, let me back up here. So, when we're planting, say red huckleberry, for instance, um, it's not necessarily going to be as it doesn't take off as easily as some of these other native plants that we have. You are going to be best off uh, trying to plant that into soil that has. A, uh, a lot of uh, organic carbon. Um, it likes to grow uh, in rotted wood. I'm sure you've seen it in the forest. It likes to grow out of uh, uh, fallen logs and things like that. So um, when we're when we're considering different plants to put in the landscape, we can certainly plant these kinds of things. But we also have to think about like their specific footprint. So like exactly where they're going. And uh, red huckleberry is one that you got to you got to consider a little bit more than just the uh, uh, the moisture and the 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 uh, the light regime. So these are these are some of the really beautiful uh, native uh, pollinators that we have that uh, can be found you know native on the island and they they thrive in our uh, particularly our, our open areas. Um, yarrow is one that will pop up. Um, almost like a weed um, and it you know it's this uh, it, it's it's this beautiful white uh, makes an umbel of flowers and it it provides pollen sources to a, just a tremendous amount of different uh, pollinators um, a friend of mine counted seven particular uh, bee species on uh, some yarrow that's grown in her yard and uh, that was seven uh, species at one time um, so that was that was that was pretty cool to hear about um, I don't I, I tend not to have have the time to be able to, to sit and count the species of bees and I appreciate the folks that do. 
Um, showy fleabane is one of our native wildflowers. It looks a lot like a daisy. And when we start to plant uh, a lot of the, uh, the a lot of the flea to uh, regenerate the seeds, um, it can really take over, and it can it can um, provide a you know a really nice uh, display of of uh, of blooms, particularly later in the summer. And it's I wanted to get back to that again. It's really important to be able to um, uh, have pollinator sources throughout the year. And it's uh, it, it's it's really important to um, to try to time these things so that uh, you know they'll be able to access uh, pollen sources. Uh, late summer is one of those is one of those times that I think often gets skipped, and so it's really nice to have have uh, things like fleabane. Uh, yarrow is is great throughout the year. Um, as far as I understand, it, it it'll continue to flower if it if it uh, um, has the right conditions. So. Um, yeah, these are a couple couple of nice ones to to keep in mind. Oops, I skipped ahead a little bit. Oh, okay. Nope, that is the the end of this uh, this brief this brief one here. So I'm going to take you to another presentation that I have, and I, I'm using a, a rain garden template. I like to I like to talk about rain gardens. I like to use them uh, when I'm talking about plant selection because they. Um, they have they have three different zones and you have to bear with me the formatting didn't want to transfer over on this but um, when we're talking about the different zones in a rain garden um, each of these different zones represent the different parts of your habitat so um, when i was talking about upland uh, upland habitat for instance earlier that would be like this zone three in a in a rain garden and uh, zone two is going to be more like your uh, um, the, the areas nearby water bodies, but not directly nearby, not, you know, being directly flooded, but will tolerate, you know, a, a more of the saturation. And zone one is going to be more like your wetland conditions. So if you're thinking about your, uh, your own landscape, your, um, let's see, let me get this going here. Um, you're probably not going to be having wetland conditions without uh, you're not going to be working in wetland conditions, I should, I should say, without a, a critical work permit, unless, you know, you haven't had like a, a it hasn't actually been designated as a wetland. But um, what these what these zone one plants are, are uh, plants that tolerate a lot of seasonal seasonal ponding. And uh, here on Whidbey, um, we actually do, you know, locally, there will be seasonal ponding. So you might have <clears throat> spots in your yard, for instance, where you have like, you know, a, an area that just doesn't seem to want to drain water. And it could be that, uh, you know, there's clay there or there's glacial till that's underlying it or some some reason that the, you know, the ground's compacted and the water's not draining. Otherwise, uh, uh, Whidbey is just, you know, it's phenomenal for, for drainage. Um, most sites, most sites tend to be really well drained. So when we're, when we're thinking about um, sites on Whidbey, it tends to, it tends to be a little bit more along the lines of um, open uh, or uh, open to, to partly uh, shady and uh, well-drained, um, maybe maybe with some seasonal ponding. And so um, getting back to it, I, I like to use this as, a, um, as, as an example for the different types of plants uh, selecting um, for these different areas. And um, as we're going through, um, let's see here, we can, I, I'd like to skip a little bit through, through zone, uh, zone one. So, when we're going into selecting like for for zone this zone two here so if you're thinking about your your own yard and thinking about say an area that you know it doesn't it doesn't dry out until say june and it doesn't start to take in water you know until like the the normal growing season but say you might have you know um during periods of like excess water you might have uh you know really well um really well saturated soil that that you know you might see some ponding so when we're when we're talking about the uh the sorts of footprint in your yard where we're looking for plants that yeah, yield so, let's, let's put whatever you want to do with the oh, sorry i heard something in the background there when we're looking for plants in the yard that will tolerate this you know seasonal saturation but with also prolonged drought um i i, I think we get into some of the some we start to get into some of the really fun plants to play with um we're talking about some of the um 
you know, some of the showier plants um, and some of the some of the plants that I think that we're a little bit more familiar with in terms of like garden type um, ornamental uh, cultivar type plants. Uh, red flowering currant, I, I really, I really love this plant. This might be one of our um, around the world might be is grown in other gardens. Um, when we're when we're talking about uh, plants like uh, red flowering currant, other types of currants, and uh, let's see, currants, and we can even type uh, talk about like uh, uh, blackberries, uh, raspberries, and things like that. Um, they do really well in uh, you know open areas. Uh, they they can tolerate some of the you know some of the lower light conditions. Um, and so when we're when we're thinking about you know what we're going to be putting plants. Um, you know, if we're, if we're looking at areas like on Whidbey, typically, you know, lots of openings um, or even in an understory, you know, this would be a, this would be a great plant. Um, again, one of the, one of the best parts about our native plants is that they're drought tolerant. And like we saw this year, um, I, if I'm not mistaken, this was the longest and driest stretch of weather that we've ever experienced in our recorded, recorded history. So, the, the more tolerant we can get with these different plants uh, for for uh, for for drought, um, you know, the, the, the better it's going to be, the easier it's going to be for you. Um, I, I just took a look at my uh, one of my uh, plantings that I did last year, and I didn't receive any supplemental watering this year, and it had about eight percent mortality. I, I was expecting to see much more than that, um, but that that goes to show just how. Um, yeah, you know how hardy our natives are, and typically when you're planting in uh, young uh, young stock, say like uh, you know one gallon or two gallon stock, you need to be planting, uh, or you need to be watering in after the planting for about two to three years, and so to to, to be able to go through the the first summer and see that that you know didn't have um, the mortality that we would have expected. It was, you know, it was great to see. So I'm not saying that that's going to be, you know, uh, for an every, every, every person, it's going to, it's going to be that same thing. But um, the, the diligence that went into um, determining the plants that went uh, into that specific location, I mean, into, um, it was an 11,000 square foot planting with a wetland and an upland buffer. And, um, you know, the diligence that went into selecting each plant for um, the, the, the areas in each area, the areas for each uh, location, um, it really helped out with reducing the mortality and uh, say, you know, it saved a, a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, I, it, it would have cost a lot. It would have cost, you know, quite a bit of money, over a thousand dollars, I think, um, for having a crew to go out there and, and, and water it, um, you know, just for a few days in the summertime. So, um, it's really important to, to be considering, you know, the different, the different locations if, if we're trying to, if we're trying to drive costs down, um, and, and, you know, your own, you know, uh, labor costs as well. Um, so this is a, this is a great plant. So this is a uh, false Solomon seal. Um, I don't necessarily like to call things false because they're, I mean, it's a, it's, it's definitely not a false plant, but, um, this is a this is a fun one to play with when we're talking about um, understory plants or full shade type plants uh, that also tolerate uh, you know really heavy drought. So um, when we're when we're talking about uh, you know selecting native plants um, you know for a landscape that have you know a variety of different uh, conditions, we we have you know it would seem a native plant for just about every every spot. Uh, wild ginger. I don't know if anybody's grown it, but it is a great plant to have in your yard. Um, it it it's one that I've I found it it uh, almost even um, likes to to grow like a zone three. Um, this is you know these these types of plants they they do really well in dark forest understories. So like if you're if you're wanting to try to find plants that are you know are growing in next to your house or if you've got you know, you know say a dense forest understory specifically that you want to plant into, this would be a great thing. And uh, you know if you're, even if you're trying to add stuff in, just trying to add diversity into your understory and in, in your garden, you know this is this is a great thing to to add in. So let's talk about let's talk about zone three a little bit. I know I've been talking about it quite a bit. So zone three is is really how how a lot of our yards are going to be looking. Um, it's it, you know it's droughty. Um, 
it doesn't doesn't receive a whole lot of a whole lot of supplemental uh, supplemental moisture and um it's uplands and i mean that's it, it, that's that it seems like that's most that's going to be most folks uh most folks areas but luckily uh since we're going to be talking quite a bit about native plants um you know we have a great selection and uh, this is where we're talking about i think specifically um a broader variety of like prayer that's when we get into some of the really beautiful uh wildflowers um i'm thinking like camas and um clarkia which also goes by uh, farewell to spring and um I mean, these are these are plants that are grown around the world for producing as cut flowers. And so um, zone three is where I, I think I, I get the most excited um, in terms of being able to select for. Um, I think it's I think it's the most challenging because it's the driest and um, the most exposed. <clears throat> so you're, you're talking about a, you know, a, a, a kind of finding that medium between um, when I'm talking exposed, you know, between heat and cold, as well as wind, and <clears throat> being able to maintain these areas. So if it's exposed, and it's having all these things hitting it, it's probably gonna, you know, obviously, it's probably gonna need a little bit more maintenance, so that it's kind of fun to think about ways to, you know, find plants that will minimize that need for maintenance, and be able to tolerate all those different, all those different um, factors. And um, it, our native, our native flowers, particularly the, the wildflowers, just they, they do such a great job of that. Here on the island, it's one of those things where there's, um, like, if you go out to the bluffs, um, say at, at Eby's Landing, and, and you look around, um, there's there's just an amazing diversity of, of wildflowers, an amazing diversity of choices, and that's a great example of a you know a zone three, especially along a bluff like that. But it's where you get into some of the, you know, some of the uh, more unique things like um, our native, our native cactus, um, brittle prick, uh, prickly pear, um, which you can grow in your own yard. And um, I don't know if you, let's see, I'll actually I'll pull that one up now that I'm it's on the front of my mind. I don't know if you saw the, uh, let's see, I think it's in one of the, one of the handouts that was provided it talks about the different sorts of um like micro footprints that you can create in your yard and um when we're talking about adding things in like cactuses if you if you're talking about if you're thinking about adding in cactuses um it's kind of fun to think about you know how can we you know, how can we optimize, um, you know, the footprint <clears throat> for different for different plants and pea gravel and other other types of rocks, but pea gravel in particular is very accessible, is something that you'd want to add in and, um, you know, make that make that footprint um, more enjoyable for something like that uh, brittle prickly pear. Um, you can also do this for some of our native sedums. Like if you if you wanted to have um, a, you know a garden that was um, specifically like uh, you know sedums, uh, stone crops. Um, you know if you wanted to add in different kinds of uh, 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 cactuses as well. Um, you know that that's that's one way to do it. So um, you you can also you can also kind of play around with you know selecting the place for your plant and then you know really working with that as well. Um, so I thought this was, I thought this was a great resource. I don't know if, I don't know if y'all saw this, but this is the, the different mulches that you can use. And so this is using, this is using a uh, pea gravel as a mulch. And, uh, we can talk a little bit about mulch as well. Um, it's, it's a, it's, it's one of those things where if you're, if we're going to be, um, you know, planting, especially in open areas that, that don't have a lot of soil, um, adding in your mulch is going to be really critical uh, to minimizing the overall maintenance um, for the, you know, for your plantings. Um, it's going to decrease your watering costs. And my favorite part is that it, it decreases the amount of uh, weed re regrowth. So you're not seeing as much um, grasses and blackberries that are, co are, are coming back. Um, this, is, this is probably going to be the, the, the single easiest way to, to minimize that. So um, I really encourage you to, to take a look at the, um, the, different, the different mulches on this list and, um, you know, definitely consider, you know, if you have, um, you know, things on your own property um, or on your own land that you, you could have access to, 
Um, this isn't an exhaustive list. Um, the only the only thing that I would say, <clears throat> if you are going to be using your own mulch that you want to source yourself, is um, you know try not to use any sort of invasive species. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to be making a lot more of an issue for yourself. Um, but uh, but yeah, take a look at this. I uh, definitely <clears throat> recommend reading more. Um, uh, from I think there were some more resources yeah from from this uh from this particular um author um I think they've even got some videos you can watch so highly recommend checking out more on mulch from them Rotation here okay so when we're when we're thinking about doing like a uh a planting, but we're thinking about sowing seeds. <clears throat> um, we wanted to talk about mulch a little bit when it comes to sowing seeds. Um, it's really important not to cover your your seeds too much. Um, uh, you're you're going to be wanting to use like a, a really fine mulch and really really keep it thin. A lot of the a lot of times, if you're if we're sowing uh, native seeds in, the, the probably the best thing you can do is just scarify it, uh, scarify the earth first, sow the seeds down, and then you know scarify again, just rake everything in again, and uh, that way you, you you reduce the amount of <clears throat> seed predation by birds, you know, other animals. Um, gives the seeds a little bit more um, contact against the ground. And once the seedlings start to come up a little bit, then you can start to add in your mulch. And I've, I've found that, you know, just doing some really light mulching um, after, after some of the German, uh, some of the germination started is really helpful to reduce uh, weed competition and to uh, increase the, the moisture retention in the soil. And so um, throughout, you know, throughout your, uh, throughout your plantings, um, Let's see. Throughout your plantings, when we're when we're talking about mulch, um, you know, you don't want to you don't want to add mulch too close in to the the tree the tree trunks or or shrub trunks particularly. Um, it's it's just going to be um, introducing you know rot and things like that. Um, let's so I'm going to be showing off some more plants here. Um, we really don't have a lot of paper birch here on the island, and I think that would be a great plant to add in. I actually. Um, I saw a grove of paper birch in Langley, and this is this is a great plant if you have, um, say, if you want to if you want to have like a um, a shade plant or excuse me a shade tree or um, particularly like a privacy screen. Paper birch will make a really nice hedge really quickly. It grows really quickly. It's a an early sort of a um, early successional sort of a tree that we have. And so it, it it does really well in poor nutrient soil, and you can you can grow it really quickly. So if we're thinking about like if you wanted to find a plant, if you're if you're if you're in an area that you know you want to get some protection, some privacy, either you know privacy from your neighbors, protection from the wind, um, you know we we also have <clears throat> excuse me native plants that that can provide that sort of a fast growing um, and, and beautiful aesthetic, and so. Um, you know, there, there's there's so many different factors when it comes to you know plant selection. Um, you know, it, it seems like we have it seems like we have something <clears throat> that you can that you can use. Um, you know, that's that's native even particularly to the island. Let's see, and I'm I'm sure that especially folks on the south end of the island are familiar with the uh, evergreen huckleberry. <clears throat> this is a great plant. Um, for like if you wanted to have hedges or if you wanted to do again like a, a wind barrier or like a short privacy screen or something like that um, very drought tolerant and uh, in my opinion one of the best uh, berries that we have for making pies and you know again so plant selection like if you wanted to have plants that you know if you're thinking about things that do well um, with low maintenance um, yeah, even in forest understories that are edible and um, provide, you know, you can see the, the flowers there provide pollinator sources. Um, this this would be a, this would be a great one to play around with. And in, in, in zone three provides a lot of those different kinds of kinds of plants like I was talking about in that in that uh, um, that rain garden list. So on the island, we're, we're talking again about a lot of these droughtier, um, low maintenance plants that uh, I, I think that that would do really well. Let's see. And again, we're talking about some flowers here. So um, I don't know if, if anybody has uh, Western Columbine growing, but it, it's a 
it's a it's actually a fairly common uh, native wildflower and it grows you can you can grow this one by seed but I think that this one is a lot more fun to plant with nursery stock it's just you get you get flowers pretty much right away with it um this is really nice it's a it's again like an all-around um it's it does well in lots of different sites I find that this one does a little bit more um it it, it, it tends to fare fare better a little with a little bit more comp, um, community around it it doesn't seem to to thrive as well in like really open areas but um it you know it again like i said it 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 can grow in just about anywhere so um if we're thinking about different different plants that you know can uh can tolerate you know that's that's another consideration to take in um our native asters we we have a, a you know i think a, at least three or four different native asters maybe more than that um that provides some really great uh some really great showy uh blooms particularly later in the summer like that like that flea bane and uh, uh provide that that native uh, pollinator source um yeah this is this is one that you'll see if you if you're you know you know even even this late in the year if you're walking around in the prairies or on the bluffs you'll 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 see quite a bit of the um I believe this is Douglas Aster or um yeah if I'm not mistaken and you'll you'll be seeing some of these still going and you know there's there's really no other pollen sources right now for for uh for pollinators like bees and um the the various different kinds of flies and, and butterflies that we have so um it's really it's really fun to play around with uh, plant selection for you know pollinator sources all right we've got some when we're talking about you know finding these different plants um we've got some different uh different uh, sources uh for the plants themselves um our our uh conservation districts native plant sale is going to be coming up and um maybe allison can can post the uh, uh information on when we're going to be uh doing the uh, we're going to be starting the the purchases or excuse me the orders um but we're we're going to be doing we're, we're already starting our purchases and uh we're we're looking forward to putting on the sale so um hopefully we can hopefully we can get this sort of stuff uh lined up before the the season really gets going um so yeah now we're going back into the to managing your site so um anybody have any questions about the you know uh, choosing choosing the plant selection or um, locations or anything like that cool thanks thanks for posting the uh the info in the chat there allison Let's see here. Just wanted to check the time real fast. Oh, great question about the uh, huckleberry growing over a septic field. Um, off the top of my head, I think so. Um, that'd be that'd be a good one to check. I, I think that we do have some resources on huckleberry growing over the subject field. Um, I don't know, Allison. Do we have do we have any particular uh, resources uh, for growing uh, shrubs or or other sorts of plants over the tops of subject fields? We do. I will post some links in the chat. Awesome. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, that's that's something that I've I've run into uh actually you know not not so much in my position as a as a planner but um you know consulting folks on landscaping here on the islands um you know it's it's uh, it's really important to take that into consideration um definitely don't be <clears throat> be planting trees too close to septic the 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 roots will punch in you know uh, without too much difficulty well let's take a look So this is another one of those great resources definitely if you're going to be considering um you know where to where to be planting into and i don't see it on there but i think i think red huckleberry i think it'd be safe to grow it um it tends to be a shallow rooting kind of a plant um 
definitely double check with some of these other resources. But typically, if you're not planting in something that's got, you know, um, like, you know, like a, a, a tree that's, you know, going to be, say, I would say, you know, a small tree, even the size of a Pacific crab apple, that's probably going to be too big. But, you know, growing in, growing in shrubs near, near, uh, um, septic is is going to be much safer than growing in the trees um i highly recommend growing in some of the some of the native wildflowers let's see were there any other questions there for the So I was hoping to talk a place. So this is this is uh, pretty much uh, as far as I understand. This is this is a list of native species to the entire state of Washington. So you might see some things on there that you're just not familiar with, or you're, you know, specifically to this this area. But um, I really I really like this uh, right plant right place uh, brochure. Um, it gives you the you know it, it breaks down the uh, exposure as well the the sun exposure as well as the the soil uh, moisture tolerance and um, I like how it just gives it gives it to you all in one spot like this and um, when we're when we're considering you know different areas for planting into um, you know really this is this is how we're going to be breaking things down and um, the more you know about how things uh, how the light progresses throughout the year how the light hits hits your hits your yard hits your land um that will inform your just you know that that'll give you a lot more more information for for picking out the you know the different plants um based on their specific footprint so you might find that um say if you're planting something in on um the north side of your house, for instance, you might not get any, you know, any sun or very, very little sun in the in the wintertime. Um, you know, you're still not going to get a lot in the, the summer um, and it's going to be you know quite a bit colder, um, you know, throughout the year and hold the hold that. Um, hold that cold through uh, throughout the day a little bit longer. So um, it's kind of it's kind of fun to play around with, um, you know, locations based on aspects, you know, north, south, east and west and in and, and places on, along your house or based on, you know, where it is on your land. Um, but, yeah, this is this is a really this is a really great way to, to plug that sort of stuff in. Um, highly recommend just going through here and uh, taking a look at. Um, you know, just the different the different plants that um, you can you can get that are local, at least to Washington state and uh you know their their exposure and their 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 moisture regime that they they can tolerate um you'll see that there's a lot more a lot more shrubs here on the bottom part of the list and th this is i think where you get into a lot more of the 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 fun stuff to play around with so um let's see here All right, so I'll get back into talking about how to manage the site a little bit and uh, talk about mulch and um, just kind of ground cover, that type of stuff um, as well. So um, like I was talking about before, I know a lot of a lot of folks are dealing with, you know, just areas where they've got bare soil or say if you've recently had development or something like that, you're going to you're just going to have bare soil. Um, and we're just, we, we really want to get that, you know, covered up as soon as possible. Um, it's going to minimize your erosion. It's going to minimize the amount of water that you're losing through evaporation. It's going to help to um, keep down, you know, invasive species being able to, to grow in. Um, and when we're, I think, I think probably the most important thing that you can do um, for planting, for having a garden, for for really, you know, any sort of uh, uh, you know planting that you're going to be doing, is getting things prepared. And so, um, when we're when we're getting things prepared, I'm thinking about you know getting things out of the soil that shouldn't be there. We're you know invasive species. You know, if we're if we're if we've got blackberries, try to get blackberries out by the roots. Um, try to pull Scotch broom and things like that. Um, if you're if you're trying to grow um, 
say if you're trying to plant plants into like a gar like a excuse me it used to be a yard or if you've got turf or something like that you know we're, we're talking about tilling up the turf and making it so that you can plant in and not compete with the the you know that dense uh, grass layer um and getting that getting that soil prepared um it really helps out in the long run so when you're putting that effort in up front to you know get it ready um you know get the weeds out of there um it it really minimizes the amount of time you spend in the long run so uh, going back to that that's that restoration site that i have um i i think i probably spent about i want to say about 85 percent of prep time um you know getting it open getting the uh, soil moved excavated it was i mean basically it's a it, it's a it's a rain garden you know it, it's got three zones it's got the this you know the saturated zone the mid zone and then the upper zone and uh getting that that site prepared um and going back to it there was there were hardly any i mean there's hardly any regrowth of invasives so um it was surrounded by compl still completely blackberry and uh reed canary grass and i believe scotch broom but because of the amount of preparation that i put into it and coupled with the plant selection and uh mulching uh with uh, some some seeding in as well it it almost i mean i would say minimized uh in uh, invasive regrowth to i would say less than less than one percent I, I can't even I, I don't even think it was that much so I can't stress enough how important it is to get your soil prepped and to um, to get it mulched um, to get your to get your weeds taken care of first that way when you prepare the soil when you prepare your site it allows for um, you know your your plants to really flourish and the more your plants can flourish and the more you can support your plants the you know the happier you're going to be the happy you know the happier plants are the happier you're going to be um, low maintenance uh, or no maintenance, um, or excuse me, it, it's, low maintenance does not mean no maintenance. We're we're pretty much always going to be talking about doing some, you know, some maintenance. Um, I think it's kind of funny when people talk about no maintenance plants. Well, I mean, I, I I've had plenty of no maintenance plants, and, and they don't they don't really last. Um, they turn into dead plants, you know, not too not too. Uh, not too long so it's really important to maintain your plants and um, it's really important like if you've got deer predation or rabbits or voles um, and, it's, and if you're planting in young plants it's really important to know um, what sorts of what sorts of hazards you have from your your your, your nearby uh, herbivores and to be able to um you know get get some things in place to prevent that so um plant protectors you know plastic plant protectors around the bases of plants or um you know even even larger like staked into the ground with a, um, a plastic sort of a netting protector around it or even more drastic if you you know trying to exclude deer that you know want to keep coming in sometimes it's important to put in you know some uh some fencing so um sometimes sometimes your maintenance um has to do with keeping animals out and uh that uh can can really be a challenge so if you're if you're if you're not looking forward to doing a lot of maintenance um i recommend trying to limit the amount of uh, uh ac access that these different plants have to you know uh, their their different predators as as long as possible you know once once your plants get established then it's not such an issue but you know two to for the first two to three years when you're especially like when i was talking about watering before um that's that's really key to to excluding um you know these these herbivores from coming in and, and uh, eating your plants you just you don't want to have to deal with that so um even if even if you've got an area that you're trying to just do completely like no maintenance on i i think that you're probably still going to have to do some maintenance on it um it, it's just it's just one of those things i mean like that my my planting that i've, I've been referencing I, I still have to do maintenance on it it's it's one of those things that i'm, I'm gonna have to do at some point so um you know it's a uh, it, it, you can you can do all the prep in the world but you're still gonna have to do some maintenance um you know like like i said it's it's really that's one of the really really great things about using native plants is that there's it really minimizes the amount of maintenance and amount especially when it comes to watering um you don't really want to be watering you know as much as possible and especially outside of the um really droughty period so like you know the end of june through well this year the end of october you don't want to be watering you know for as, as long as you possibly can 
Um, and so, yeah, when we're when we're talking about getting the site prepped, getting mulch down, and uh, getting things prepared, um, we're we're thinking about um, you know making sure that we're able to keep water in the soil and uh, keep those invasives from coming back. Um, if we're going to be planting in, say, um, uh, if we're thinking about different using different kinds of stock, um, we need to be thinking about um, like uh, the different the, the the length of time that we're the the time frame that we're looking at uh, putting the you know uh, getting the sorts of results from from putting the plants in the ground. So um, it's really important to consider. Um, you know, just the, the, uh, sorry, I'm just taking a look at the chat there. So it's, it's, it's important to consider, you know, how long, um, how long you're going to, you're going to see results from, from some of your plants. So, um, you're going to see a lot, you know, you're going to get a lot more, uh, showiness from, from plants that are going to be older stock. It's also going to be a little bit more expensive. Um, but if you're, if you're going to be looking at, um, sowing seeds, for instance, if you're trying to grow uh, native wildflowers, um, there's a lot of, if you want to have showing this right away, or if you want to, if you're okay with having a little bit of leg time. So, um, sowing in seeds versus, uh, planting in bulbs, uh, is really critical. Um, like if you, if you sow in camas seeds, for instance, you're going to be waiting for like two or three years before you start to see the flowers if you um if you plant in uh say the uh, clarkia amina seeds the uh, four uh, to spring you're going to see flowers the next year um so it's really important if you're trying to if you're trying to consider also you know when when these things are going to flower if you want to see them immediately um you know how to how to purchase and which stock which stock to purchase um our 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 bare roots which is going to be like in our plant cell that we have um bare roots have a little bit more um they have a little bit more care that they need they they're people tend to to want to plant those a little bit more like um you know nursery stock that comes in a pot but they bare roots really need a lot more care they need more um more soaking uh, to begin with they need they need to have uh, um more watering even pretty much like immediately after planting and they need to, to be to to make sure that they get the mulching and then in the the, the following year to, to really get you know um a lot of watering in but the great thing about bare roots is that they're much much less expensive than nursery stock um i think you probably tend to get about 10 bare root plants for every nursery stock like a one gallon or a two gallon so um bare roots are really great for for keeping the cost down and if I'm not mistaken, I think there might have been, I think we might have had one of the resources that talked about using uh, how to grow, how to, how to plant bare roots. And if we didn't have that in there, I'm sure that we can, I'm sure that we can add it in. Let's see, was it this one? Yeah, I, I really like to plant with bare roots. Um, I find that uh, even though they're, they they take a little bit more effort to get in the ground, um, it's really nice to be able to it's really nice to be able to to save money and uh, to get you know like a large a large quantity of bare roots. Oh, great! Thanks, Allison. Okay, so yeah, just getting back to it. Um, so yeah, we're, when we're, when we're thinking about, you know, getting these, getting these areas prepped, um, it's all about minimizing the weeds and, uh, making sure that we are, uh, keeping the soil in, keeping the soil nice and saturated with water and really minimizing that water loss, especially throughout the, the droughty periods. Um, another nice thing about mulch that, you know, we really don't talk about a lot is that it it holds uh, the different nutrients in the soil longer because it's the, the water you know rainwater storm water is not just uh, rushing out through uh, with the the nutrients it's able to table it's able to lock it in and, and as the as the organic matter decomposes and goes down to the soil that also helps to to um, lock in those those nutrients longer into the year. Um, 
And the other, so there's, there's kind of a drawback to it. I don't know if we have a resource for it, but if you add too much, say too many wood chips, if, so if, if you're thinking about, um, you know, you really, if you really want to add in, you know, a lot of mulch and you want to try to suppress, say like a bunch of blackberries, a lot of folks, they think, you know, well, I'm just going to use a whole bunch of wood chips. I'm just going to mulch like, you know, six inches deep with wood chips. Um, it's really important to consider that um, at a certain point, um, too much, uh, especially wood chips, too much, too much of that sort of a woody material, it actually has a negative effect on nitrogen. It starts to pull nitrogen, the the fungi and the bacteria start to pull nitrogen out of the environment to be able to to uh, be able to grow and do their thing while they're decomposing that that wood. And so it actually it actually you know can work backwards on you. So adding too much mulch can can actually kind of backfire, and, and it's not necessarily the best thing to have. Let's see. All right. So we got some different references for uh, um, gardening with native plants, specifically that that plant uh, of the Pacific Northwest. That's one of my favorite landscaping books. Um, I don't know if, if anybody's had a chance to read it, but uh, Arthur Kuckerberg put it together. Um, one of the one of the great uh, professors at the UW um, put that together, and that's that's really just one of the I, I would say um, one of the one of the best that we had for um for, for washington specifically um definitely if you get a chance to take some take a look at some of these they're they're great references for for uh um, helping figure out um, how to landscape with with native plants all right so there's you have any questions about the preparation or mulching or anything like that Let's see. I'm going to look at through this resource a little bit more. So this is a little bit more dialed into uh, locating specifically here in Western Washington. Um, this is from is this yeah this is from King County. This is from uh, one of their uh, internal departments that they have. Hey James, um, there are there yeah. are a couple of questions in the oh. chat if you want oh, to pause before you move on. It's okay. Uh, the first one was about after construction. Do I need to put on topsoil if my soil is sandy? Oh yeah, yeah, great question. Um, you know, it, it's not necessary. Um when we're talking about sandy soil we we can definitely work with that and uh you know if you, if you add topsoil to it it's going to you know help to to do that um it's going to help to stabilize things and make it a lot more friendly to planting into um if you you know if you're trying to cut down on costs it's not it's really not necessary um i had a had a site visit earlier today in fact um where i i i, I talked to a client um who um had done some construction and had um you know some uh some fill material that they had been spreading out and they you know they wanted to know what what they could do with it and uh I, what i had discussed with them is that um when when we're talking about like that that's that that's really sandy soil that that post construction kind of a thing um it really mimics the what would be the the early cereal stage of a of a forest or an ecosystem here that um say like after a forest fire or some some great disturbance it exposes you know a bunch of the soil a lot of our plants are 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 really well tolerated to um to being able to deal with those sorts of conditions so um if you if you you know if you don't want to have that in topsoil if you want to try to, to keep your costs down you don't necessarily have to use uh, you don't have to bring it in you can you can use some of these different native plants that we have okay and then yeah the the cardboard and newspaper um under the yeah under the wood chips i really like doing that too um it, i find that you know it, it's it, i think it looks quite a bit nicer when you have the 
the wood chips over the top of it. Um, but it really adds in that extra layer of, of, uh, you know, like suffocating the, 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 the weeds from, you know, from being able to germinate. So, um, yeah, I definitely, I definitely recommend putting the cardboard, uh, under, under first and then putting the mulch in over the top. Um, I think you, I think, I think you'll be impressed with the, the added, the added effort into it. Any other questions for mulch or any other comments with it? How often mulch? Good question. Yeah. So, hmm. You know that really it's going to depend on how much uh, how much you start with, um, how quickly it's decomposing. Um, I think uh, I think it's you know it's important to take a look at um, uh, you know how much how much regrowth is coming in. Say like if you're trying to suppress uh, invasive species from coming back. You know, just keeping an eye on keeping an eye on that, and if if you're starting to see some some uh, germination, then then you know start mulching again. But um, I think you know um, if you're if you're adding in say like uh, two or three inches of of wood chips, um, I think that's going to last you probably about a year or two before you're going to have to add in anything else. Um, I think wood chips would be a little bit longer lasting than some of the some of the lighter mulches um and definitely not as but um yeah so like if you're putting in straw mulch straw mulch is probably going to break down within like um six to eight months i want to say um you know it might depend on the different the different source but um it, it it really depends on the different kinds of mulch you're using and uh, how much you start with i would say are probably the two most important things okay and then when using compost should we not use too much with data plants but stick with wood mulch um that's a that's a great question you know it's it really depends on the plant and um i would say i would i would say I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, want to, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too, I wouldn't go too little with, with compost. I think it's, I think it's perfectly okay to use, um, to use some compost in there. Uh, yeah, they, they don't necessarily need to have, um, much added compost. Uh, but that said, it, I think they really like it. <laughs> um, our, our soil just tends to, it tends not to hold a lot of nutrients, specifically nitrogen. Um, but because of because of how droughty it is, and um, because of the you know like the heavy rains in the winter time, um, our soil naturally just wants to lose uh, its nutrients really really quickly. And so you know plant, planting in a compost is is really helpful. Um, if you say anytime anytime you're planting. Um, especially nursery stock and uh, you're planting into like a native landscape and you're trying to minimize your maintenance and that kind of a thing um, you're going to run into an issue with needing to needing to get rid of the the potting soil from the roots a lot of times I, and i've seen it, it is, it's something it's really something something to see but a lot of times what will happen is when you plant nursery stock into the ground that you know that nursery stock that got that has really nice potting soil and it's got its it's got its fertilizer it's been really well maintained you put it into like a nutrient bare soil that doesn't get a lot of water doesn't have a lot of you know uh, a lot of anything a lot of you know soil life or anything like that it, it the root ball will just stay in the same spot and it, it will not i mean the roots will just want to stay there and it'll it'll actually get root bound underground in its in the hole you made for it and so um it's really important to consider that if you're putting compost into the ground because it it the plants can kind of do something similar to that um so adding in too much compost is important um in, in that regard but you what you can what you can do to 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 get around that is to be able to uh just mix in like when you're digging your hole just mix in the soil that you've dug out and you know add the compost into that and then you can um you know kind of thin your compost out that way but compost is a great way to, to add fertilizer in uh, really safely um, if it's, you know, especially if it's been really well aged and it's not hot, it's really, really safe to add in, um, to your planting. 
Okay, it looks like there is. Oh. Thanks for the resource there on hedgerows. All right. Hedro plants and trees. Yeah. Great question. So, you know, that's a that's going to depend on, you know, um, the sort of soil you have, uh, how how quickly it's draining, um, also your your light exposure, um, and you know what, what kinds of plants you want to have. Um, I think that um, in, in terms of in terms of a hedgerow, uh, I think I, I think um, wax myrtle and its its shorter its shorter cousin uh, sweet gale, those are the two that come to mind in terms of like a really fast growing, fast densifying, uh, really uh, easily maintained sort of a shrub that um, you know they they don't they're not real showy with flowers, but they're very showy in vegetation and they they smell wonderful, so they're really great landscaping plants. Um, those are those are two that I would I would say would be really great hedgerow. Um, they're evergreens and, uh, they, they're, they're evergreen plants. They're, they're deciduous, they're deciduous plants, but they, they keep their, their waxy leaves on, um, until they decide to drop them in the summertime. Um, but if you wanted to add in like, uh, you know, different, you know, different structure, um, like our black hawthorn is a really popular, um, is a really popular hedgerow plant. Um, Pacific crabapple is a great hedgerow plant. Um, ocean spray that's a that's a really fast thick growing sort of a hedgerow plant um, if we're talking about say those most of those plants minus for zones two and three um, if we're talking about like really wet areas uh, pacific crab apple would be a good one for hedgerows um, i think the hawthorn would be okay in some of the drier spots um, but then you're going to be looking at like spirea, Douglas spirea. That would that would make a really great hedge. Um, not a not a really tall hedge, uh, but then um, um, you could add in some of the you know some of the some of those taller plants um, as well, like the the um, the hawthorn and the the willow or the 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 hawthorn and the the crab apple. Um, you could do willows. You could do dogwoods. Um, that paper birch when it's young, it makes a really nice hedgerow. Um, it, it can get tall. So um, after a while, it's more of a forest. So it then becomes more of like a riparian buffer. Um, talk about roadies. Yeah, roadies are a great choice. Um, so roadies are a great choice specifically like in spots for um, forest understories, forest edges. Um, they do they they do tolerate openings fairly well so um you'll i mean you, you see them on the sides of the road um in central woodby for instance um and they're really drought tolerant so um they're a really great choice um i think they're i think they're really underutilized i would i would love to see more of our native roadies particularly in landscapes um but yeah they're they're great um they're to me they're they're kind of like an iconic um woodby island understory tree understory shrub depending on their size um so yeah when i think of an understory or a, a a forest edge plant i definitely think of roadies uh with roadies one of the considerations to make is that they are poisonous um i think every part of the plant's poisonous um as long as you don't ingest it you're okay but you know for dogs uh pets wildlife uh you know children um folks that might not know better um you know might not be the best might not be the best choice but um you know their roadies are you know kind of quintessential northwest garden plants and it, it's uh it, it's great to be able to use our native our native uh, uh coastal rhododendron so yes i think they're a great choice <laughs> James, would now be a good time for me to launch the poll? Yeah, we can do that. Okay. And folks, feel free to keep um, dropping in questions, but this will just take a few moments.
Yeah, service berry and rust. Um, yeah, rust rust is rust is an issue with a lot of our a lot of our native uh, plants, um, and and this year especially, I saw a lot of rust um, in a lot of different places. Um, our native service berry, it's it's definitely you know it's 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 a great plant to have. Um, it's gonna it's gonna have rust. Um, it's just it's it's just gonna you know be an issue. But um, I I haven't especially on the islands and. Uh, um, I've experienced a lot. I've, I've, I've worked around a lot of it um, in the Oak Harbor area. Um, really large, large, um, I want to say probably 50 year old plus service berries that, um, you know, were just doing great. You know, they, they had they had rust, but they were they were they were fighting through it. So, um, yeah, I, I, service berry is a great one to have. Um, it's a great one to plant. And, uh, you know, if you're if you're growing plants for for having a food source, you can't you can't beat having a service berry. Oh yeah, and also that's another great a great hedgerow plant. I, I forgot about that one. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if there is a spot that you could plant uh, um, service berry and not have it thrive. <laughs> you just basically underwater. It seems like on the island, everywhere else it'll it'll do really well. The examples of nightshade that grows on the island and what to watch and what to watch for. You know what? That would be. I, I wish I had. I wish I had more info uh, specifically to nightshades. Um, that would be a great question for uh, if you could get in contact with the uh, um, the master gardeners. Uh, I can. I can talk a little bit about it though. Um, so, like, if you're if you're talking about morning glory, um, there are different varieties of morning glory that you can grow that aren't going to be like the really heavily invasive sorts of uh, you know bindweed types of things. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, I think there's I think I think there's Japanese varieties that uh, particularly uh, are less invasive and more more showy. But uh, I, I think that that'd be a that'd be a better one for the uh, for the master gardeners. Um, most nightshades uh, that, you know, aren't your you know, like, say, your tomatoes and things like that. Most nightshades are are kind of invasive. So kind of kind of kind of one to keep an eye on. Okay, trying to trying to go down trying to go down in order here and try not to miss anybody. Um, natives that thrive without supplemental water in the summer. So I don't know if I specifically have have mentioned any natives that thrive without supplemental water in the summer. Um, just about just about all of our natives will thrive um, if they're planted in the correct place. So as long as you're not planting in like, you know, real heavy water loving plants and in, in upland areas, they're not going to need supplemental water once they're established. But until they're established, they definitely need to have that supplemental water. Um, like I was talking about with my restoration site, I don't know if you were here for that. Um, I saw about 8% mortality without any watering. Um, and uh, that was, that's kind of lucky. I mean, it's that you're looking at much more than that. Um, and uh, supplemental watering, you know, you'll, you'll really bring in, you know, your, your um, success if you, if you have, you know, your supplemental watering during the summertime, especially, but for the first two to three years, it's critical. Um, and, and it's, uh, I would say probably the, Probably the most important thing when you're doing your watering is to uh, to make it consistent and to you know you're you're looking at like a half an inch to an inch of water per plant per week. Um, so say you know half half a minute to a minute of water directly to each plant per week, and I recommend watering directly if we're talking about supplemental watering, because that way you reduce the amount of. Uh, um, well, you, you, you reduce erosion for one thing, you don't, you're not using a sprinkler, um, but you're reducing evaporation and you're reducing rust. Um, it's, uh, you know, that's the, that's, it's not going to be um, as big of an issue if you're not getting uh, water on the leaves. And yeah, so ignore the rust. Yeah, I would ignore the rust. Um, you know, unless, unless it's really getting to the point where, um, you know, it's, it, it, it looks like the plant is stressed. Otherwise, you know, the rust is kind of it's I think it's a good indicator for the stress of the plant. Um, if if the whole plant looks like it's just covered in rust, it, it might mean the plant is uh, is is not doing too well. But yeah, I would I would say ignore the rust. Um, there's other plants as well, like uh, uh, Pacific Madrone that gets uh, it gets a blight and it's really common. Um, 
the thing with rusts and, and blights and a lot of these native pathogens is that they're not eliminated from the environment the way that they used to be. The way that they used to be eliminated was through forest fires, wildfire, uh, wildfires. They would eliminate the um, they would eliminate the spores, um, you know, in the in the leaf litter and in the ground layer where the uh, the plant, the, excuse me, the, the bacteria or the fungi, whatever that pathogen is, it would eliminate that um, that particular part of its life cycle. And so we don't have the forest fires being able to break the life cycle of our, our of, the, of these pathogens. So um, unfortunately, we just kind of have to live with it. And yeah, uh, ignore it the best you can. Um, if if it's getting to a point where, like I said, it's 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 causing a problem, um, you know, feel free to to reach out to me, you know, um, as a, as a, a one of the planners of the the conservation district, and you know, maybe we can um, you know try to figure out some different solutions for you. Let's see here, any native honeysuckle? Yes, that's a. We have off the top of my head, we have three native honeysuckle, um, twinberry honeysuckle is a shrub and twinberry is one of those if, if we're talking about the rain garden zones it's one of those that is in zone two it does well in zone three but i've actually also seen it growing in wetlands where it's actually in standing water um and it does well in if i'm not mistaken in in all exposures except for like really dense forest uh so real low light and it it struggles in open sunny areas if it gets really hot without a lot of supplemental moisture um that's a great uh, restoration plant a uh, great um pollinator source one of the earliest pollinator sources I, I i believe that we have um and so it's really critical early in the season it has berries that uh that wildlife will uh birds will will eat uh throughout the year um i don't know if anybody's tried eating twinberry uh honeysuckle but as one of my uh, friends in restoration uh eloquently said it it sucks the joy right out of your mouth so i do not recommend <laughs> a twinberry as a as an edible as an edible plant um we do have two other honeysuckles and i kind of get excited talking about them because they're really beautiful plants and i would love to see more of them being grown uh, we have western trumpet honeysuckle and that's a a, a more of a hmm, let's say it's it's it it does a little bit better compared to the other honeysuckle that i'll get to um in it does better in upland conditions and um a little bit less uh let's see a little bit more moisture, I should say. It does well with uh, with less, uh, excuse me, less um, well drained soil. Um, then we have the uh, uh, the hairy honeysuckle. That um, that's uh, more of like your. Uh, you see that a lot more on bluffs or in exposed areas, and it's more of a. a, a or it's a pink honeysuckle is another name for it, and that's it, it's more of like a. A ground covering sort of a shrub. I see it a lot more on the bluffs and um, along trails, uh, especially like trails that are near near meadows and things like that. But it, it's it it does really well in exposed areas. Um, but so the the western tropical honeysuckle is more of your forest uh, your forest honeysuckle, and then the the pink honeysuckle is more of your exposed, um, a little smaller. But I, I actually saw them growing together today. It was really cool to see actually growing directly together. I could I give that demonstration of, you know, what the difference is because the, the pink has has hairy leaves and the uh, the Western trumpet has uh, smooth leaves. Um, they both have just phenomenal, phenomenal blooms. Um, it's they're 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 flowers that um i don't know if uh i don't know if, if a hummingbird can pass by without without visiting so if you like hummingbirds that's some of the best to add into your yard other other pollinators too um if you if you are really interested in trying to attract like large uh say um like your swallowtail butterflies or um sphinx type moths those are the ones that will vi uh, visit like uh, honeysuckles because of the shapes of their flowers so yes, there are native honeysuckle, and I believe um, there there is another native honeysuckle. Um, I think it's called red honeysuckle. That's the I think it's uh, Lanisra utahensis. That's also native to Western Washington. 
that's an edible honeysuckle. I know I, I mentioned that twinberry just doesn't taste very good at all. Uh, red twinberry does apparently taste great. I haven't tried it yet. Um, it's a lot less common on the west side. I think it's more common in uh, colder areas. I think it needs a longer, a longer season, a longer cold stratification season, uh, so that the the seeds can germinate properly. So, if I'm not mistaken, we have four native, four native honeysuckles, uh, but those those first three are, are much more common. But you can definitely plant red honeysuckle, and nobody's going to hold that against you. And I should mention, um, so I, I talked a lot about native plants. I don't know if I mentioned any any non-native plants, in fact, but, um, you know, if, if you're if you're trying to plant, you know, for aesthetics and things like that, and you're you're wanting to plant, um, you know, cultivars, you know, feel free to plant, you know, plants that you enjoy that aren't invasive, or if you want to use, um, if, if like, if you're trying to find things that aren't invasive that aren't going to be an issue for you that are similar to our native our native uh, uh, our native plants um you know you can you can find nursery stock different cultivars that are almost exactly you know they're, they're, they're the same genus as our native plants so you can find lots of different cultivars of say dogwood um or um uh honeysuckles again honeysuckles you got to be a little bit more careful of um japanese honeysuckle is is quite invasive um so definitely you know definitely uh, pacific nine bark um, there's a whole bunch of different species of nine bark that you can look at um there's a you know, number of different uh different kinds of maple um but when we're one of the reasons i really recommend native plants over cultivars over uh ornamentals is that um, you know, they're, they're, they just, they're, they're, they're not going to become invasive. They might, you know, they might really thrive and they might take over a spot, but they're not going to be invasive. Um, you know, you're not, you're not running into a risk of them becoming rampant and, and causing issues for your neighbors, which it, it sounds kind of dramatic, but, um, it's, it's important to consider because, uh, we don't know what's going to be invasive until it is invasive. So highly recommend not using, um, uh, especially plants that you are aware of um, that do well and can, you know, jump, jump the board of your, bound, the, of your garden. Any natives that may be a too aggressive to plant? Um, I was talking about Douglas spirea before. Um, spirea comes to mind um, as a plant that uh, that can be too aggressive. Um, snake root. I'm not I'm not familiar with snake root. Let me. Is it? Uh, can you give me a scientific name for snake root per, per chance? Um, there there definitely are native plants that be, that can be too aggressive. Um, and uh, say if you're trying to manage a, a landscaping and you plant in uh, spirea and it, if, it, if it's on a wet spot, for instance, and you don't want to exclude a whole bunch of other plants, um, you're going to have to do some maintenance on spirea. You're going to have to dig it out. Um, salmonberry is one that I, I, it comes to mind that a lot of a lot of people think of it as as um, as a weed. And when I say, no, that's that's a native plant, they're like, really, I've, I've always thought that that's a you know, that's that's, a, you know, an invasive Let's see. Huh, I'm not I'm not familiar with snake root off the top of my head. Let me do a quick search here and see if I can. Sometimes I I know plants that I've dealt with in the field. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Well, I think I understand kind of what it is. Okay. So plants, plants that act like this. So I'm thinking uh, cow parsnip, I think is a good example of a plant, a native plant that um, can really take over an area really rapidly. 
Um, it's a great wildflower, uh, great uh, pollen sources, but if you've got a wet area, um, especially a recent construction, um, I saw a lot off of Mutiny Bay Road that had just, I mean, it was like, you could say it was completely colonized by cow parsnip. It looked like, uh, 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 what's it called? A uh, giant hogweed. Um, it looked a lot like that, but I mean, it was, it was definitely cow parsnip, but it, it's a native that'll take over an area that's been disturbed and, um, is, you know, can, that's holding, that's holding moisture and it's also poisonous. It's also, it's, if you get the, if you get the juices on it, uh, from it on your skin and it, it reacts in the sunlight, you get some pretty nasty burns. So that's one that I think of, um, that, that acts really similar. And, uh, you know, you, you, you definitely want to keep that under control. Like if you're, um, thinking about access, if you've got, you know, kids, pets, um, livestock, you definitely don't want to be dealing with, um, you know, too much, too much running with, with cow parsnip. Um, we, you know, I've been talking, you know, about how, um, you know, how great our native plants are and how, you know, how many, how many different great uh, things they have, but we do have some native plants that you should be, you know, you should be thinking about. And, uh, you know, we do have um, uh, Western, let's see, Western uh, poison oak and Western uh, poison ivy. I don't know if I've encountered it on the island, but I've encountered it in Western Washington, especially in the Seattle area. Um, native plants, very much not things that you want to come into contact with. If you are, you know, it, it, I just wouldn't recommend coming into contact with them in, at all. I, you know, you don't want to know if, if those things are, are poisonous, but, um, yeah, you, we definitely have natives that you'll, you'll want to keep, uh, keep in consideration, but for the most part, um, I'm trying to think of, I'm trying to think of very many natives besides that, that you know, have, you know, toxic, talk, uh, toxin issues or, you know, other sorts of other sorts of hazards that they, they create. And, uh, we're, we're really lucky to have, um, some really well-behaved, uh, native plants. Yeah. The, yeah, I was reading that it's the, uh, white snake roots poisonous to livestock. Yeah. There's unfortunately a lot of things are poisonous to, you know, a lot of, a lot of invasives are, are poisonous to livestock and, uh, um, like I was talking about rhododendron, rhododendron is, is poisonous. Every, every part of that plant is toxic. And, uh, you know, fortunately it's not like, you know, just doing some maintenance on it, it's going to cause toxin, but or toxicity. But, um, you know, if you're, if, if you don't know any better, if you're, you know, a farm animal, just going about its business, you might, you might have some issues with it. And I thought I saw a question earlier about green roofs. I don't know if I... I think I skipped over it somehow. They were asking uh, if you have any plant recommendations, native plants for green roofs besides sedums. Yeah, and yeah, great question. Um, you know, not off the top of my head, um, I would recommend anything that doesn't have you know like a real, real deep root uh, root structure that's you know potentially cause damage to the to the surface. But I think that. Um, you know, if you, if you can get enough water to establish, you know, like the different uh, native wildflowers, um, I think that you'd, you, you might be able to find quite a few native wildflowers that will be able to tolerate that really high, uh, high heat, uh, high drought sort of a condition, uh, high exposure in general, get that real cold in the wintertime as well. But yeah, I think that, I think that we do, um, but I just, I don't, I don't have any off the top of my head. You might you might want to do a search for um, the low impact development manual for Western Washington. I have I have a copy from like 2005, and it gives recommendations. And I don't have it anywhere handy, and it's got coffee stains all over it. But um, that's a great resource. It's the uh, I'll say it again. It's the uh, um, low impact development manual for uh, Western Washington. Oh, thanks, Allison. Yeah, it's fun to, I mean, it's fun to plant, um, it's fun to plant sedums. Oh, here we go, flocks. Yeah, there's one. 
Flocks is a really fun one. I don't know if uh, I don't know if folks have seen it on uh, the side of that highway um, in Coopville, um, but like around the transfer station, it's uh, a <laughs> it, it grows like a weed. I love it. But yeah, it looks like this 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 reference this resource that Allison just brought up is a really a really great one. I think that that's the low impact development manual. I'm just going to say it is the the one that I have is it's a it's a it's a monster it's several hundred pages and it's it's a it's a large it's like a large textbook. <laughs> it's 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 pretty awesome. So if this is the same thing, it's going to give some really in-depth info on uh, and probably even more updated on um, how to plant uh, uh, rooftop gardens and other sorts of really interesting high exposure um, low impact development type things So we are coming up on seven o'clock. Um, do we, it looks like we have another question coming through. Um, and then James, how are you feeling? Did you want to try and wrap up fairly soon? Yeah, yeah, we can we can wrap okay. up a little bit early. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, the question on moss inhibitor on the roof and uh, the runoff going into rain barrels. You know, I really, I really don't recommend using moss inhibitor. Um, if you're going to be using rain barrels, um, I just, I don't know what the downstream effects are. Um, I, I don't think it's going to be, you know, causing a, causing harm on, especially like your shrubs and, and things like that. But um, it's a uh, definitely a consideration. I would, I would try to minimize the amount of, of chemicals that you use if you're going to be collecting runoff. Um, you know, if you're going to be using anything on your roof to at all for cleaning or, or, for, you know, inhibiting. So Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I um, so I, I I've actually done quite a bit of rooftop cleaning and a lot of uh, of moss control myself, uh, just you know, like for my own private business. And I I've always discouraged uh, folks from using um, uh, from any sort of moss inhibitor. Um, I just it it tends to be different kinds of metals that are used, like zinc or uh, things that salmon don't really like to have in the water sources so uh as, as much as i can get away from you know encouraging the use of anything that could uh, go into the water try to try to get away from it and especially going into a rain barrel yeah i would say i would say no so thanks thanks dick All right, looks like we're coming down to the end here. If anybody has any other questions, I'm happy to happy to answer it in the time that we have. Otherwise, it's been a pleasure talking to you all, and I hope I hope I was able to get you some some good insight into selecting plants for different spots in your landscape. And I'm happy to I'm happy to provide further assistance if you want to get in contact with with me, um, you know, for for site visits. I'm I'm happy to help. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks, Robbie. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much for your time tonight. Yeah, yeah, you bet. Thank you. And I just wanted to share the request assistance link. Um, we've got this uh, form to fill out on our website. If anyone is looking for a consultation, that's the best way to get in touch with us. Um, feel free to also reach out or reply to my emails, and I should be following up with you all. Um, 
hopefully tomorrow, but as soon as we've got the recording up live, that'll be posted on our website and YouTube channel. So thanks everyone so much for coming out. Thanks, Allison. Hope everybody has a great evening.